Good morning, everyone. And a very warm welcome to Worship in St. Nicholas. If you're visiting, a special welcome. We're delighted to see you. And we'd hope that you'll sign our visitor's book in the vestibule and take a copy of our church newsletter. And if you're free, join us for tea and coffee in the new hall after the close of worship this morning. And to those who are joining us online later today, wherever you are, from Australia to the south of England and to the north of Scotland, welcome to St. Nicholas here in this very windy, wintry day. Wherever you are, you are sure of a warm welcome here. The God who brought the world into being before time began, the God who is ever present in the universe, caring for his creation, the God who will be with us and future generations, that same God calls us to this place to acknowledge our need, to seek strength for our daily living, to cast our concerns upon his love and to be open to his Holy Spirit in word and in prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ and in the spirit of community, I call us all now to the celebration of worship. We worship God, we sing his praise in hymn number 200. Hymn 200, Christ has made the sure foundation, Christ the head and cornerstone. Let us pray. Lord of the storm and Lord of the calm, Lord of the raging sea and Lord of the quiet harbour, Lord of the darkness of the night and Lord of the light of the new morning, we come before you now 
trying to recite the wonders of this delectable, delicious new day which beckons us. All around us, you circle us with your embrace. You open your heart to us. You warm us with your love. And here now, in this holy space, grace is on the loose. Your boundless grace seeking to forgive us, to cleanse us, to renew us, to capture us. We are so well schooled in the language of prejudice, of hatred and jealousy, the language of spite and revenge. In our time together, whisper afresh the grammar of heaven, the mother tongue that lifts and inspires and praises and challenges. In the music and the words of the hymns we sing, in the details and nuances of the scriptures we read, in the hidden cadences of every heart now gathered before you, dazzle and stagger us with the phrasing of heaven. In every syllable that is uttered, may we hear your clear word of life come in the flesh, lived in the person of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we're such a strange conundrum. We're faithful and we're fickle. We're full of good intentions of living better lives. Then we find ourselves caught up in petty squabbles, in moodiness, in resentments. In daring hope, we seek newness and healing. Do among us in this hour what none of us can do by ourselves. Lord of homecoming and forgiveness, work your wonders among us. By the power of your Holy Spirit, move us beyond ourselves, beyond our favorite cliches and our tired excuses, that each of us may become a rounded doxology, that folk may hear and see something of Jesus in our lives, through whom you have spoken in such inscrutable ways. Amen. Lovely to see you on this stump. Who knows what this is? What is it? What do you say, Lexi? A remote. A remote. Well done. Is that what you call it in your house? I call it a doofer. <laughs> the doofer. The doofer works wonders. Whoever's got the doofer can control what's on the television. They can put the sound up. They can put the sound down. They can change channels. The doofer's great. You're in charge when you've got the doofer. Now, I was in a house this past week. Now, this doofer only works the television, but I was in a house this past week where the man had a remote control that worked not only the television, but he could switch on the lights with it. He could close and open the curtains with it. He could put the music on. He could work the television with it. It, it did, I'm told, 15 different things. That was a tremendous doofer, a wonderful remote control. Now, this is a very simple one, but whoever's got the doofer, that man was definitely in charge of all those things in the house. Long ago, there's a story about the day that Jesus showed that he was in charge. He'd come to Capernaum, the fishing town where he often went, and he went to the synagogue, the local church. It was a Sabbath, and he went there to teach. And the people came, and they listened. And as Jesus was preaching and teaching, suddenly, in the congregation, somebody interrupted. Somebody shouted out, Jesus, what have you to do with us? Now, interruptions. We have interruptions in services. Sometimes people faint. Sometimes people don't feel very well. But here was a man interrupting the service by shouting out. A man whom the Bible tells us had an evil spirit. And Jesus went up to him and said, Be gone! And the Holy Spirit, the evil spirit left the man, and the man was cured. The man's life was now looked after by Jesus. Jesus was now in charge of his life. And all the people in the synagogue that day, they thought, Who is this guy? Who is this guy that he speaks, and he speaks with such authority, with such power, 
and he cured this man of his evil spirit. Jesus was in charge, and the people in the synagogue knew that, that Jesus was in control. Now, Jesus wants to be in control of all our lives. Now, he's not a control freak, certainly not a control freak, but he wants to control your life and mine because he knows what is best for us. He wants us to control our lives because he knows what's best for our plans for the future. He knows what's best for us in our living and what we say and what we do. And only by letting Jesus be in charge, then can we find a happy life. Only when he's in charge, then we find true happiness. So, if we want to find happiness, we let Jesus be in charge and be in control. Now let's sing your hymn. At number 566, when I receive the peace of Christ, my loneliness shall end. The Word of God, as we find it contained in the Scriptures of the New Testament in the Holy Gospel, as recorded by St. Mark. St. Mark's Gospel, there in the first chapter, and reading from verse 21. Hear the Word of God. They came to Capernaum, and on the Sabbath he went to the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, for unlike the scribes, He taught with a note of authority. Now there was a man in the synagogue possessed by an unclean spirit. He shrieked at him, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus rebuked him. Be silent, he said, and come out of him. The unclean spirit threw the man into convulsions and with a loud cry left him. They were all amazed and began to ask one another, What is this? A new kind of teaching? He speaks with authority. When he gives orders, even the unclean spirits obey. His fame soon spread far and wide throughout Galilee. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The choir will sing the morning anthem. Let his love be found in you. Let us pray. Grant that our minds may be directed by nothing other than the desire for your truth, O God, that our lips may only speak what pleases you, and that our hearts may ever love you more and more. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In today's modern world, the gospel reading must seem so old-fashioned and hopelessly irrelevant. Jesus rebuking unclean spirits. Now, come on, Fraser. Exorcisms are for the movie screens, not for real life. How about Jesus teaching with authority? In our modern world, nobody can teach with authority anymore. Young folk are taught very early on to question authority, not to trust everything they see or read. And indeed, indeed often with good reason. Because not everything that we see or read is true. There's such a thing as fake news. Advertisers stretch the truth. Our politicians twist the truth. And the news media and the social media all seem to share different versions of the truth. We've every good reason to question authority and any claim to truth. But here we are this morning with an old-fashioned reading that I think that is more important than ever. Because in a world without any clear 
without any certain truth. Jesus Christ continues to offer a clear teaching, a teaching with authority. He is offering us in his teaching eternal truths, eternal truths that we can trust and believe and even build our lives upon. I wonder if you've heard the story, and I don't know whether it's apocryphal or not, but it's a great story, and that's a good illustration in a sermon, of the secondary school teacher who had injured his back and had to wear a plaster cast round the upper part of his body. It was fitted neatly under his shirt, and it wasn't noticeable at all, so that he could go on with the business of his teacher's day, and no one knew he was wearing it, this plaster cast under his shirt. His first day back at school, he was still wearing it. His first period in the day was the worst fourth year in creation. I had a teacher at school, Cathy Donaldson, who, she was a French teacher in first year, she used to always say to us, you're the worst 1A1 I've ever had. She said that every year to every class, so we didn't really take much notice. Anyhow, this teacher's first period in the day was the first worst, for, worst fourth year. Rowdy, noisy, uninterested in what was going on. And well, the, when the bell rang and he came into the classroom, all the pupils continued to talk and laugh and treated him with complete disdain as if he weren't there. The teacher walked over and, over and opened a window as wide as possible. He then started working at his desk while the pupils continued their terrible fracas. And several times a strong breeze made his tie flip up onto his face. Finally, he reached over and picked up a staple on the desk and stapled his tie to his chest <laughs> in three places and continued to work. The class of boys immediately quietened down and you could hear a pin drop for the rest of the lesson. And he didn't have any more bother with that particular class for the rest of the year. Wouldn't it be great to have that kind of authority in everything that you did? I think of the teachers I had whom I remember still with affection and gratitude. I think of Harold Schooler, my primary three teacher, whose beautiful copper plate handwriting was a joy to behold. And I've still got some letters that he penned me much later in life as he followed my ministerial career. I think of Muriel Glover, my primary five teacher, who every morning began the day with mental arithmetic, drumming it into us until it became second nature. I think of Roddy McLeod, who taught us in primary seven, one of only a few male teacher role models who actually made learning the intricacies of English grammar fun. Two afternoons a week. He taught us English grammar, and it stayed with me all these years. I think of Nora Parker, my French teacher at the John Nielsen in Paisley. My favourite, I suppose. She was elegant. She left the scent of Chanel No. 5 in her wake. <laughs> and she captivated that third-year class with the glories of the French language. I, t I think of teachers like this. And I'm amazed at the impact that they had in my life and indeed in the lives of so many pupils under their care. I'm amazed at the way good teachers continue to feed us long after we've left their presence. They spent long hours in school. They had to cope with some pupils who were very recalcitrant and didn't want to learn. Yet what authority, what power they had. And of course I had also some very poor teachers, and you probably did as well, they also had power and often used it in the wrong way. Teachers are very powerful. They can change lives. They have a power to brutally wound or wonderfully heal young lives. And into this world of powerful teacher that our gospel reading this morning calls us to enter. It's the early on part of the ministry of Jesus in the Gospel of St. Mark. And it begins with teaching teaching. Now, we don't know what the teaching was in Capernaum in that Sabbath morning. The sermon wasn't remembered that day in the synagogue. And I suppose most sermons are forgotten. The preacher's words only reach the back door into the vestibule and go no further. 
But what makes Jesus' teaching authoritative is his person. Now, in today's world, we often use the words power and authority interchangeably. But I think we should make a distinction between the two. If you peer into the world in which Jesus lived, the scribes, along with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they had power. Oh, yes, they had power, all right. They were the religious mafia. They were the religious esteemed. They, had, they were the interpreters of the Jewish law. They decided who and what was acceptable. They decided who and what was beyond the pale. They were part of the power structure of Jesus' day. Their power was simply given. But they did not necessarily have the support of the confidence of the people. So what they did was, although they had power, they lacked authority. They lacked authority. Do you remember how the apartheid government in South Africa had the power for many years, huge power, to differentiate between blacks and whites. Blacks weren't allowed to sit in the same park bench as whites. They weren't allowed to travel in the same bus as whites. They weren't allowed to walk in the same part of the pavement. They had power, all right, but a jailed man on Robben Island named Nelson Mandela, he had the authority. Oh, yes. It's a similar situation to the scribes. In the gospel, they're often presented as oppressors of the people who lack a genuine understanding of the Jewish law. They possess no idea at all of grace. In other words, they had power, but they were lousy teachers. But they were still powerful on account of their position in society. They may be lousy teachers, but they still got to call the shots. And there's a lot of folk like that around us today. On the other hand, genuine authority comes not from one's position in society, but from somewhere beyond one's self. Authority, and I would argue very forcibly, is embodied through a sense of call, of vocation. Jesus' teaching is authoritative because of who he is. He said, and the man in the synagogue said, you are the Holy One of God. It's kind of like those good teachers who peopled our past. We don't remember the details of what they taught, oh no. As much as we remember the power of their person and their lives, they influence us so much. There was something about them that made us sit up and listen. And the worshippers on that Sabbath in Capernaum automatically contrast Jesus' teaching with what they've experienced in the past. They contrasted Jesus' teaching with the teaching of the religious leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. And unlike the scribes, they said, this man teaches with authority. There was something about him that made him so different from the religious leaders round about him. In other words, in other words Jesus brings something extra to the table. Jesus' person has something that the scribes don't. Now, what is that something? What was that about Jesus that they said he teaches with authority? Well, you only need to look at what happened next. Jesus heals a man with the unclean spirit. And to prove his authority, Jesus heals a man and drives out the unclean spirit, makes him well again. Now, in St. Mark's Gospel, there is no differentiation between Jesus' teaching and his healing. It's all part and parcel of the same package. So when we hear Jesus teach with authority and see him heal with authority... They're amazed, they're astounded, because this is something new. That's not at all what they'd experienced from the scribes. This teacher was different. He practiced what he preached. Good teachers of authority, their teaching is authoritative because of their God-given gifts, because God has called them to be teachers. Good teachers are teachers for the right reason. They teach not for the money. What money, I hear them cry. Not for the prestige. What prestige? They teach because they are called, because it is they who are compassionate, caring, gracious people who have the interests of their pupils and their students at heart. 
And it is those God-given, God-blessed aspects of their person that give their teaching authority. So, friends, to have power, to have power does not necessarily mean one has authority. And just because someone has authority does not necessarily mean they have power. Jesus had the authority, of course. Oh, yes, he did. But in the end, in the end of the day, it was the scribes and the Pharisees who had the power to call for his crucifixion. Authority, in the best terms of the word, is persuasive. It doesn't need, nor does it depend on threats of force and power. And folk gravitate towards genuine authority because it is persuasive, because it speaks to the heart. It speaks to something deep down in here because genuine authority is recognized as being different. It's recognized as having come from where? From where? From above. Jesus' authority came from above. It was derived, it came directly from his heavenly Father. And it is this divine authority that's constantly being critiqued by those in power because they feel threatened by it. It's this divine authority that is constantly being challenged because they fear they are going to lose their power and their status. That's why the scribes and the Pharisees were terrified of Jesus. They could see him usurping the influence that they had upon the people. Jesus' authority is found in his ability to back up his words and his teachings with action. He practiced what he preached, and the man with the unclean spirit was healed that day. Jesus had the authority to do what he said he would do. He spoke with authority. Why doesn't the church, the world, take the church seriously? Quite simply because we fail to practice what we preach. So then, how are you now to recognize genuine authority? How are we to distinguish it from bogus? Now, a key factor seems to be consistency. If my words match up with the kind of person that I am, that I seem to be. You'll have heard the saying, as I have often, I can't hear what you're saying because who you are is shouting too loudly. I can't hear what you're saying because who you are is shouting too loudly. If the words we hear are at variance with the person speaking them, then those words will not ring true. Friends, amid today's clamoring voices, the need for wise and prayerful discernment has never been greater. Where is authority? And everything we do here in church, how we govern ourselves, how we relate to our fellow members, how we work and witness and worship, in the end, the authority for all that we say and do is none other than Jesus himself, the Holy One of God. Not picking random texts from the Scripture to back up our arguments, but quite simply, listening to Christ himself, it's through his eyes and through his eyes alone that you and I are to look at the world. Where is authority? Where is the one who must be obeyed? You and I were bought at a price. You and I are here to obey. uh, Jesus Christ, he is our supreme authority. And as a great minister from the past said, if he is not Lord of all, then he is not Lord at all. There alone is your authority and mine. And now unto God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, be ascribed on honor and glory as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We sing the hymn number 470. Jesus shall reign where'er the sun does his successive journeys run.
Our intimations are as printed on our pew leaflet. May I again extend an invitation to everyone today to come to the Kirk Cafe through in the new hall after the service for tea and coffee and a chance to meet together to get to know each other better in fellowship around the table. Now, today our Malawi committee has our monthly book stall and there are more books through in the new hall than in Waterstones. So if you'd like to come through and there are much cheaper than they are in Waterstones, only a pound for a hardback and 50 pence and there's a lot of excellent titles, I know, because I've read some of them. So please come through and see. And all the money is raised to go to the work of our Malawi committee. So that is through our new hall, which if you come out this way, straight along to the far end, or out the front door and round the side, you'll be very welcome there after the service. Tonight, Alec has our Back of Five Club from 5.30 to 6.30, and everyone is warmly invited to that. And then on Thursday 1st, our Guild, they had a great day at their Burns Afternoon on Thursday past, when Bryce became the, po the poet himself, the bard, and they had a superb time at uh, the Guild. And this coming Thursday is another good meeting when it's the Kazunzu Village of Hope, organised by the Vine Trust. The Guild project is one of the proje those projects, and everyone is warmly invited. And then next meeting of Up Close and Personal, the informal Bible study, is a week tomorrow, the 5th of February, at 10.15 in the Old Hall, and the Reverend Jack Brown looks forward to inviting and welcoming folks to share in looking at the men and women of faith. We were invited by the University of Glasgow uh, to take the, uh, hold here the Faith in Scotland's constitutional future. The Reverend Dr. Matthew Ross, who lectures at the University of Glasgow and is local minister at Collington Church in Edinburgh, asked us if we would, could host a meeting, which meetings that have been held throughout Scotland, ecumenical, non-partisan, political, neutral meeting, exploring how folk and churches relate to faith, to constitutional questions in Scotland. Now, we here are the Ayrshire Choice, so there's people from all over Ayrshire who are welcome to come here, and the meeting will be held on Wednesday the 21st from 7 to 9.30 here. If it's not in the old hall, depending on numbers, it will be here in the church. There'll be a video presentation by Murdo Fraser, the Reverend Dr. Maggie McTernan, Stephen Noon and Kate Forbes, followed by discussion. Now, you must apply to be able to come to this. It's missions free, but you must register attendance. And so if you either phone doc, uh, Dr. Ross or email him for catering purposes, Louise, and the team will look after us with tea and biscuits at the end of the evening. It should be a good meeting. It will be a very interesting meeting. I'm sure it will evoke many questions and much discussion. So that's Faith in Scotland's Constitutional Future on the evening of Wednesday the 21st from 7 to 9.30 here in the church. And everyone is warmly invited. These are all our intimations. Let us present our thank offerings to God. <laughs>
Let us pray. Lord our God, you have given us so much richly to enjoy. Accept these gifts which we bring into your house. Make us like them, worthy of your grace, and grant that as we offer them and set them upon the holy table, we may with them give to you the love and loyalty of our hearts, the gold of our obedience, and listen to your authority in every aspect of our living. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. Gracious God, on this ordinary winter Sunday, seated here in our familiar pew amongst familiar faces, we give you thanks for beauty wherever our eyes have seen it. In the heavens or on the earth, in the raging sea or tall trees, in the flight of the birds or the vulnerability of a snowdrop, we praise you. For beauty heard, whether it be in the voice of the singer, in the sound of the organ, whether it be in the whistling of the wind or the laughter of a child, we praise you. For beauty neither seen nor heard, deeper than words can express, higher than the stars, the grace of lasting affection, of hospitality generously offered. And above all, for the beauty of him in whom life became redeeming grace, even Jesus Christ, we bow our hearts in reverent praise. And with our thanksgiving, we make our prayers for the world, so weary of its old ways, weary of warfare and injustice, poverty and selfishness. We make our prayer for the countries where some are intoxicated with war, where a silent slaughter is still happening, though the world's gaze has moved on. For Israel and Palestine, for Afghanistan, for Iran, for the Yemen. Give to those who are trying to make peace an inner assurance of their vocation, constant patience in their negotiations. Let the world breathe more easily, Lord, as this year rolls on. We pray for those vast swathes of the globe where folk are wondering today where their next meal will come from, where women walk miles in the scorching heat to fetch water for a family's needs, where disease is rampant and medicines are few, where children die destitute and forsaken. Pour down the riches of your grace upon all those in governments who have the power to effect change, that your spirit may move the hardened hearts of men and women to alleviate suffering, to bring help and healing, and keep us from the sin of thinking that their problems are nothing to do with us, for we're all children of the same Heavenly Father. We make our prayer for the church and for all the churches in this borough as we seek to bring the gospel of Jesus to our parishes. Give us all joyful and generous hearts which allow you to work through us. Put our differences behind us that we may be united behind the great commission of Jesus to make disciples. May we speak with authority that others may listen and come to know you. To the perplexed, grant a light upon their path. To the weary, rest and renewal. To the bruised and the wounded, your healing touch. Heavenly Father, on our, on our hearts is someone whom we know who's ill. Someone who's a special problem to deal with in the week ahead. A friend whom we've neglected for too long. A neighbour 
who has recently laid a loved one to rest. A young person going through a tough time. May your blessing rest on each whom now we name in the silence. Finally, Lord, we remember with thanksgiving all those who've run the race and have kept the faith, even if that faith was known only to you. Those who've now gone to their eternal reward, the close member of our family whom we miss more than others can ever know, the friend whose early death will always leave us feeling sad, and those who once sat by our fireside or near us in this holy place, who were part and parcel of our daily living. May your light shine upon them forever, and our lives be richer because of their memory. All these prayers we humbly present in the precious name of our blessed Redeemer, Jesus Christ, in whose words we sum up all our prayers, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing prayer is number 263, hymn 263, God of freedom, God of justice, God whose love is strong as death. Worship is ended and service begins. Go out into the winter day. Go out warned by the Spirit of Christ. Go out and listen to his voice, that voice of authority that tells us how to find life and life in all its fullness. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you and all those whom you love this day and forevermore.